Hi, my name is Ariana Mendible, and today I'm going to be telling you about my work in data-driven data -driven decompositions for traveling waves. So in general, in science and engineering, there are spatiotemporal systems that are high-dimensional, non-linear, chaotic, and have multiple scales of time and space that we're interested in studying. And traditionally, these systems uh, tend to have also traveling waves. This is a symmetry that just means any coherent structure that moves throughout space and time. So here we have an example of some vortices that are traveling around in a climate model, a shock wave behind an airplane, and a shock wave rotating around a detonation engine. The typical way that we study these systems, because we don't have, in general, governing equations that we can solve analytically, is by using data-driven methods to squish the data into a smaller system so that we can compute solutions to predict and control these systems. The main way that we do this is through proper orthogonal decomposition. So the types of data that we want to consider are systems like this, where we have a function u that's of space and time. Uh, space is x and time is t. And u can be any type of function. It can uh, be here in the wave height, or it could be something like voltage or pressure or anything that we want to consider. The proper orthogonal decomposition breaks this system down using space-time separation of variables into modes in space and time and compresses the information into a small number of modes. So we compute this using the singular value decomposition, which is efficient and well-studied and used all over science and engineering. Um, then when we compute the modes, since the energy is compressed into a small number of modes, we can truncate them and use only a few of them to represent the system fairly well. The problem is that SVD or POD does not work with traveling waves. So here I have a stationary wave that's shown in pink, and I have a, the same soliton wave that is traveling in space and time. When I go to decompose that wave into one mode, we can see that the stationary wave is very well represented, and almost all of the information is captured, as you can see here, almost 100%. Whereas with the traveling wave, one mode reconstruction gives us a very poor representation of the wave, and we also don't capture very much of the energy. So what happens when we increase the number of modes? Here's two modes, still does not do a great job, five, 10, and we need almost 20 modes to be able to represent this wave and capture all of the information. So this is not a desirable outcome. We would like to be able to capture this traveling wave in a very low number of modes. So one approach that many people have done to alleviate this problem is to first shift the data into a traveling wave frame so that those traveling waves appear stationary. So our method that we've developed is called unsupervised traveling wave identification with shifting and truncation. And we're going to use machine learning to detect interpretable wave speeds so that we can shift the data into these moving coordinate frames given by x minus ct and create low dimensional models in the moving coordinate frames so that the waves appear stationary. The way that I'm going to explain this model is through an increasing uh, complexity so that it makes a little bit more sense when I piece it all together. So the simplest type of example I can show is a single wave that's moving with a constant speed. The first step that we can do to decompose this is to find the wave peak points given by x and t that show the crest of the wave moving across. We can uh, make vectors x and t that describe that. And then to find our linear wave speed c, we can solve for the constant in this equation, which is a simple backslash. To make it a little bit more complicated, what happens if we have a wave that has a non-constant speed? So a way that we can do this is, again, find the wave peak points, x and t. And now we need to provide some kind of information of what we're searching for. So providing some candidate model library, which contains any functions that we want, linear or nonlinear, will allow us to use C to find the coefficients of those functions that correspond to the models that we've input to find a, a function that represents this wave speed. So then we can also solve this using x minus CT, which is solved by a simple backslash. Now, the most complex version that I'm going to go through is with multiple waves of constant or non-constant speeds. So here, I'll use this example of my original data, where I have one constant wave and one non-constant wave that are intersecting. We're going to, again, provide a model library, which will contain any potential wave speed functions that we would like to use to represent either of these waves. We also have to use a variable n that tells us the number of waves that we're looking for so that we can initialize our system properly. We've decided to 
use ridge detection to find the peak points of these waves, which is a machine learning algorithm that's used in image processing, and it's extremely fast and robust. And now that we have two different waves, we have to tell our algorithm which models we want to fit to which points. So in order to do this, we need to separate those wave peak points into multiple groups so we can fit the right models. So to do this, we're going to use spectral clustering, which again is a machine learning algorithm that is well studied and robust. Now comes the optimization formulation. So we still have our x minus ct written in just a slightly different way. So now we've augmented our T matrix to include all of those speed functions based on the data that we have pulled out from our waves. Then we have our coefficient matrix, which now we've augmented to have one for each wave. So each row of the coefficient matrix is going to correspond to one of the waves that we have up there, and each column corresponds to each model that we have in our library. And again, we also have x uh, corresponding to each of those waves. And now, in order to fit only certain points to certain uh, models, we can use a weighting matrix which masks those points uh, using a 0 or a 1 weight to apply one model to one specific wave group. So our optimization is great. We have you know, all these different models that we can fit to any of the waves that we want. But the problem is, if we provide a full library of, say, 100 different potential wave speed functions, and we have 100 points x and t, we are going to get a completely full matrix that describes our wave perfectly. We can fit the wave speed exactly using as many functions as we can, but the issue is that this isn't really interpretable and doesn't have any relevant physics that underlie it. So we're going to also add a sparsity promoting term. Sparsity in a matrix means that most of the terms are zero and we only have a few that are relevant. This uh, can help us find uh, parsimonious models that we can really understand. And this kind of makes sense in real physics because even highly complex systems such as the Navier-Stokes equations only have a few relevant terms and we know that these, uh, these equations can describe very complex dynamics uh, with only a small number of terms. So after we've found our functions, x minus ct, that describe our wave speed, we can shift our original data into coordinate frames that correspond to each of those wave speeds. And now we can use our traditional methods, such as POD, to decompose these into low rank shifted frames. So now that I've gone through my method, I'm going to show you one example on simulated data. So here we have the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that I have initialized with an initial condition that gives us wave speeds 2t minus 7 and negative 2t plus 7. The nonlinear Schrodinger equation exhibits this breathing phenomenon, and it also has nonlinear interactions between the two waves that are intersecting. So this is a pretty complex system um, that is a good test case for our method. I've input a library of a few polynomial speed functions in order to fit to this known wave speed. So after I run my untwist method, which uses 2,700 iterations, I have discovered these models for my wave speeds, which very closely match what we know the wave speeds to be. The more interesting thing is when we do POD, we uncover some very physically relevant modes. So here we have our right traveling mode in this coordinate frame and our left traveling mode in the other coordinate frame. Now this shows two individual waves with very little noise for the other wave that has been intersecting. And when we use a rank two reconstruction of our data, we can uncover a physically realistic model that closely matches our original. I also want to contrast this with what happens when you use POD on the traditional coordinate frame as is normally done. And we have our first two POD modes shown here, which are not necessarily physically relevant. It doesn't show our two soliton waves that are uh, contrasting each other. And then the reconstruction is also not faithful to the original. So that's great. We've been able to uh, validate our system on some simulated data. But what we really want to be able to use this method on is some real laboratory data or data taken from experiments. So the experimental data that we ended up using to validate our method was from a rotating detonation engine. So here we have an example of a simulation of a rotating detonation engine, which has this shock wave that travels around the annulus of the chamber. So here is an example of a real rotating detonation engine where we collected our experimental data here at the University of Washington, thanks to James Cook for our information. 
and we have a video of the actual collected data. So as the waves rotate around the chamber and exhibit bifurcations and nonlinearities, which are not well understood, we can take this video looking down the annulus of the chamber and find the pixel intensity of these different uh, wave fronts. So after we have all of these different video slices stacked up, we can take each one and integrate the pixel intensity around the annulus of the chamber to get this vector of our wave shape. After we do that for each time step, we can get the data that looks like this, where all of our waves are traveling around periodically in X. So again, here's our original data, and this is actually taken from that video that I showed you. So we know that there are two waves when you zoom in really close, even though it's not super clear on this top one. So here are our two waves. When we apply our untwist method, we can shift the data into each of these traveling waveframes with respect to the top wave or the bottom wave, and this is what we obtain. So now we have a straightened wave, which will be amenable to POD, and we can find a mode that will represent this shock wave well, and then the bottom shock wave well. So our first POD mode shows that we actually capture the shock front extremely well for both of these examples, and this has a physically relevant meaning. We can also contrast this to the POD mode that we get from the original data in the laboratory coordinate frame, which does not have a good physical meaning and doesn't really reveal any dynamics that underlie the system. So aside from finding the wave shapes of these different waves, another interesting uh, avenue of research is to find the interaction between the waves and find how those dynamics might be uh, showing up in different regimes. So here we have that same data that I just showed you, and here's a representation of that by just uh, computing the difference between the two different wave fronts. So this is just the spatial difference between those uh, wave fronts. We can use dynamic mode decomposition to find a linear data-driven model. I have not provided any uh, functions or anything to decompose this data. And we can obtain an interpretable equation that gives a model for how those waves are interacting, which fits the data very well. Another interesting avenue is to find w models that might be nonlinear to fit the data. So here's a different example of our RDE data, where we have three waves that are traveling around the annulus and are interacting nonlinearly. So we can tell that because we have this peaky periodic behavior in our waves, and they seem to be accelerating and decelerating uh, with respect to one another. So we can pull out those positions just like I did before, and here we have, uh, I'll call it Y and Z for our two different wave positions. And we can fit a lotka volterra equation to find a model for this. So the lotka volterra equations are a good candidate because they represent this peaky periodic behavior very well um, and is used typically to model predator and prey interactions. The models that we compute can be seen here and we can tell that these are good models because they, uh, even using only half the data to train them, maintain their frequency throughout the data set and do capture that peaky behavior very well. So overall, uh, I've showed you the method that I developed to decompose traveling wave data using uh, only data, and we can get out interpretable speed models to tell the interactions between these waves. Um, the method that I developed is uh, available in this paper, and then the work that we've done on the rotating detonation de en engine data is available in this paper on archive. You can also find code for all this on GitHub, and thank you for watching. <laughs>